All right, as we look at forces as a whole, when we go into context of our previous chapters, let's first think of our uh, polar groups. So one of the first things we talked about was hydrocarbons. And when we think of hydrocarbons, we think of single, double, triple, and arenes. So those are the alkanes, alkenes, alkynes, and then the rings that look like a ring. What we'll notice about these, based on what we just learned, is these only have C's and H's. If they only have C's and H's, the best these can do is London forces. This is also called dispersion forces. And these are going to be weak. If we move on to our next group of category, we look at things that have dipoles. So if we look at things that have dipoles, think of oxygens and nitrogens. So if we look at alcohols with ROH, we look at uh, ethers with ROR, we look at phenols with AROH, we look at alkyl halides with RX, uh, as long as those halides are fluorine chlorine specifically, we're pretty safe. Uh, we can also look at amines, RNH2. Then we can look at the ones that have carbonyls just like them, so R carbonyl OH, R carbonyl OR, R carbonyl H, R carbonyl R. So this is acids, esters, aldehydes, and then ketones, and then lastly R carbonyl NH2, which would be our amides. All of these have dipoles. So whether it's the uh, alkanes over here, alkenes, alkynes, so that E versus, or that A versus E versus Y ending, and then arene, E ending, all London dispersion forces, and it's true that everything in this second list also has London dispersion forces too, but they also have something more, and that's a dipole. They have dipoles from oxygen to, so I can draw that out a little bit, they have carbon to oxygen over here and oxygen to hydrogen there, those are dipoles. Carbon oxygen, because carbon is always the R group, carbon oxygen, carbon oxygen, oxygen hydrogen, Carbon fluorine, carbon chlorine in particular are dipoles. Bromines and iodines would not be. Carbon nitrogen, yes. Nitrogen hydrogen, yes. Carbon carbon, no, but carbon double bond oxygen, yes. Carbon single bond oxygen, single bond to hydrogen to oxygen, yes. All these carbonyls are going to be dipoles. It's just that acids have more, esters have a little bit more, and amides definitely have more. So as we look at these groups for uh, alcohols, ethers that are isomers together, phenols, organic halides, amines, carboxylic acids, esters, aldehydes, and uh, ketones, and then amids. All have dipoles, all have strength. But then we look at who has the best of the best strength. So who has hydrogen bonding? Hydrogen bonding is OHs and NHs. So alcohols have hydrogen bonding, phenols have hydrogen bonding, amines have hydrogen bonding, carboxylic acids have hydrogen bonding, and amides all have hydrogen bonding. They're going to be the best of the best. 
And when we think of alcohols, this is exactly where we see carbohydrates. Phenols, not so much. Amines, this is where we find proteins. And with carboxylic acids, this is where we find proteins. We do see a little aldehyde and ketones with carbohydrates. That makes them very polar as well. Uh, amides, this is what we see in DNA. We also see amines in DNA. We also see alcohols in DNA for that ribose and deoxyribose sugar. So it's important to see how everything down here is kind of lipid-based, with the exception of a little bit of ester. But then when we have carbohydrates, proteins, uh, DNA, we're starting to see that, sure, alcohols are in, you know, capable of hydrogen bonding, but aldehydes and ketones are also in carbohydrates. That contributes to their polarity. DNA has amines and amides. That's the bases that hold it together. Side to side, that's the A versus T, two hydrogen bonding sites. C versus G, that's three hydrogen bonding sites. So it gives it its double helix, but it also has those very polar sugars that are attached to those phosphates. And then proteins in particular are made up of amino acids. So understanding these as a whole, you know, very important to realize uh, how far we've came in these last three chapters in understanding polarity. So as we look at proteins here, we can revisit our last chapter a little bit and see that it's the NHs that are hydrogen bonding. It's those NHs that are hydrogen bonding. It's those NHs from those amines that are hydrogen bonding. Our carboxylic acid lost its functional group because it formed water in that condensation process. Carbohydrates have OHs. OHs have hydrogen bonding. And that's important to realize that this hydrogen bonding, this hydrogen bonding holds the strands together uh, in a chain form, but also from strand to strand, we have hydrogen bonding holding each strand together uh, as well. So this is why those uh, starches, you know, tend to stay intact in our body because there's just too much super glue holding it together. Our enzymes aren't strong enough or powerful enough and don't have enough time to break them apart into a meaningful uh, portion that we can use for energy. We can also look at DNA. As we look at DNA, we have to remind ourselves of what we saw in the last chapter, and that's that the hydrogen bonds that we see, those are adenine and thymine based. That's two hydrogen bonding sites. It could also be cytosine and guanine, and that's three hydrogen bonding um, sites that form those. And then that two and three doesn't mix and match, which is very important as well. Antibiotics, their ability to work is their ability to hydrogen bond. So if we look at some of these uh, structures below, we see hydrogen bonding on the phenol, hydrogen bonding on this amid or this amid. Um, we also see hydrogen bonding on this carboxylic acid. Over here, we see lots of hydrogen bonding on alcohols. Um, eventually down here, some more alcohols. Up here, more alcohols. So both of these, very dependent on their ability to attract the cellular structure of bacteria so that it can help your immune system uh, stop the growth of that bacteria. So vancomycin, a very potent, uh, or at least used to be, hydrogen bonding based uh, antibiotic. And when we look at it, we can see quite a few um, OHs, NHs. So the reason it's so potent is because it has so many sites at which it can hydrogen bond. Most of these at the bottom are amine and amid based. We have plenty of other alcohols. Uh, and then we have some phenols down here. But notice the ability to bind to bacteria is the ability to bond to its hydrogen bonding sites, its hydrogen bonding sites. So just by hydrogen bonding, we can interact with bacteria. And if we were to remove just one of these hydrogen bonding sites, remove one of those, we're gonna be a thousand times less effective. 
That means it's going to take you a thousand hours to feel better if it were a resistant bacteria. So the biggest problem that people have with antibiotics is they don't take the whole bottle. They teach bacteria down here how to avoid this hydrogen bonding by letting a little bit of it survive. So by taking half of your pill bottle, you kill 90% of the bacteria, but the other 10%, this 10% learned from that mistake, and now vancomycin cannot bind to it effectively. It loses its effectiveness. Now you need a stronger antibiotic. If you were to do this several times, you're going to get to the point where there's not an antibiotic that exists. It's going to be strong enough to attach to bacteria because you've made it so resistant. And it's all based on that hydrogen bonding concept that it works. So do your doctor and yourself a favor. Take all your pills. If you don't, you might get into the position of making a super bacteria that can kill the planet, which is more true than you know. So as we look at replacement antibiotics, really what they're doing is taking something that works and then kind of changing its hydrogen bonding. If you change an oxygen to a nitrogen, is that amount of difference in shape and polarity from going bent or pyramidal, from going from a dipole of 1.4 to 0.9, is that enough to make it a stronger antibiotic or a weaker one? So oftentimes they use something that works well and then they change some atoms and then they test it to see if it works better. So a lot of antibiotics are just derivatives from other antibiotics. So in our last video, we'll remind you that even though molecules have some strength, they're not near as strong as things that have metals.